And now I will introduce our second speaker. Uh, it is great pleasure to have Francesc Torres here with us again. He's been here before and part of our workshop. Um, he is a Spanish multimedia artist who has, um, who has lived extensive periods of time, not only in Catalonia, but in Paris, New York City, Berlin, and he's shown at many, many uh, very important artistic venues in the world. He also writes uh, for international journals and in Spain, and does uh, and curates exhibitions as well. Uh, he has he has obtained many many awards that <laughs> I don't even have time to list, but I will mention that he has been awarded the National Endowment for the Arts Individual Artists Award four times. Uh, so, welcome. Good morning. Uh, it's a, a pleasure and, uh, and a privilege to be here. Uh, Thank you, Ophelia, for that. Uh, I'm an artist, uh, I've, and I've been uh, in doing this for uh, the more than 50 years now. And now, uh, <clears throat> uh, what I do, or art, uh, art in general, has never interested me as a problem. Uh, it has interested me as an activity. Um, the things that I see, that I perceive as problems, what uh, keep my gears churning, always happen outside of the, the frame of reference of art and outside of that context. And that's primarily uh, things having to do with politics, ideology, uh, history in general, and, and basically to the, at the very base of it all, uh, uh, how we behave, and why do we do what we do to each other? Uh, in 1995, uh, uh, as you remember, uh, we commemorated uh, the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Uh, uh, there had been another uh, World War before, First World War, uh, which was called the war that, uh, to end all wars. That was the First World War, and then there was the second one, uh, which was a, uh, the biggest you know, uh, military conflict in history, as we all know, 50 million uh, dead people, 25 of them Russian, uh, and everything else that, that went with it. Uh, you know, the history is already known by everybody. Uh, immediately after the, the war, uh, and immediately, the, uh, the Nuremberg trials you know, set the stage uh, for... Uh, uh, all the premises that supposedly uh, were needed in order not to repeat that. Uh, new uh, terminology was coined, uh, 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 human rights, uh, 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 crimes against humanity, um, genocide, all this you know, comes directly uh, from that, uh, that event. Fifty years later, during the commemoration of, uh, of both the end of the war and the Nuremberg trials, uh, the beginning of the Nuremberg trials, uh, in the backyard of Europe, the Balkans were in flames with concentration camps, with ethnic cleansing, um, genocide, Shevardnica. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's the kind of uh, question that always uh, informs my work. Uh, why is it that, that we do uh, this type of things when everybody agrees that, uh, obviously, uh, that would be the worst thing that could happen, uh, but every time there is a chance uh, that the circumstances uh, and all the ingredients are in place, it happens again, and there is never, never, ever uh, a shortness of uh, uh, human material for that. So, uh, um, Perhaps uh, the combination of what I, I just uh, uh, exposed with the fact that I'm uh, from Spain and uh, uh, that uh, you know my family uh, was uh, directly involved uh, during the war. Uh, uh, they fought in the, uh, the Republican side, and uh, so it had an, an impact, uh, a very very deep impact in, in the, the history of the family and and. Um, 
all these ingredients basically shaped the, the, the work that I've done for, for many, many years. Uh, the, I'm not going to elaborate on the, the issue of, of uh, historical amnesia in Spain because that was uh, uh, addressed brilliantly yesterday by uh, Ana Miñarro and, and uh, Emilio Silva. So, uh, there is no need for, you know, for me to uh, go on, on on the subject, except with one l little comment. Uh, what's happening right now in Spain, uh, it's not only the consequence of uh, uh, the uh, Francoist right having been very, very skillful at uh, uh, navigating the storm, so to speak, and managing to you know, finally uh, you know, making things you know, come uh, their way. Uh, because uh, there, is, there is something that uh, precedes uh, or that inaugurates, if you will, uh, the transition uh, in Spain, which uh, has been called uh, euphemistically uh, the Moncloa Pax, uh, which consisted on, on a, a, a very, very important uh, meeting about, uh, among the political uh, Spanish political class in, in its entirety, uh, from you know both sides and all ideologies, in which a lot of things were decided. And uh, obviously, there was n not uh, the 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 event was not based exclusively on on uh, deciding how uh, uh, the recent memory of the country was going to be managed uh, officially. That was a. Uh, uh, a gathering to address the economic uh, problems that the country uh, was facing at the time, which was severe. And, uh, and this, in a way, has been the counter argument when somebody, such as myself, mentions that, that moment in, in, uh, in political uh, Spanish history, say, no, no, uh, uh, there was no conspiracy. Uh, that was something that had to do with economics. You know? But uh, it comes uh, by itself uh, that if you are going to address an economic problem, the first thing that you need is political stability. And in Spain at the time, given the conditions and in relationship to its direct uh, uh, past, uh, the first thing that was, uh, had to be addressed and, uh, and uh, a pact was needed was uh, so that the political class, regardless of ideology, could behave as such. The poli politi uh, politicians had the need to do so, to be so, and, and uh, act accordingly, which is understandable and has its merit. However, um, that was done that's, we're talking about the pre-constitutional you know, time. The, we still had not the constitution. It was something that was done among politicians. It was not submitted to the, uh, the, the, uh, to the people. Uh, there, were, there was no consultation with uh, uh, the citizen body of the country. Uh, it was simply uh, addressed and decided and agreed upon among the political class, and that was it with its virtues, but also with its consequences. Uh, the most important of all, the fact that uh, the Spanish recent history was uh, stolen uh, from the, the citizens of the country, because uh, uh, it was decided beforehand what was going to be okay to be uh, remembered, uh, what was going to be okay uh, to be left alone, and. Uh, and what was going to, uh, to be the narration of, of our uh, recent history, uh, which uh, uh, is questionable because we can see very, very clearly what the consequences of that have been. Um, so uh, I'll, because of this, uh, uh, there, were, there was a moment in which you know, uh, two things uh, uh, coincided. In, uh, in you know, talking now about myself, you know, my professional development, uh, one was uh, uh, the realization that the most important event of my life uh, had taken place nine years before I was born, 
and, uh, and uh, that w we're talking about 10 years ago, so uh, I was sort of kind of a, a late awakening, but it, it makes sense because you need, you know, historical time and perspective in order to, you know, uh, recognize what the, the consequences of that have been. Uh, so that, on one hand, of course, I got extremely angry. Uh, I mean, this realization, uh, 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 which was in front of me all along, but uh, you know, to be absolutely conscious that uh, uh, the most important event of my life had happened you know, even before I was born, it was absolutely a shock. You know? uh, I couldn't really have a direct answer to it. There was nothing I could have done. Uh, I was simply a clinically pure product of a historical event against which I couldn't really do much about, you know, couldn't really basically answer, you know, had only uh, been there to deal with the consequences. Um, so uh, perhaps because of that, uh, there was always a, 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 an obsession, if you will, uh, uh, to find a way to get as close as possible to what had been missing, you know. Uh, the, my family's uh, history, to a certain extent, you know, uh, covered that, that goal, uh, but of course it was always a reconstruction. Uh, it didn't really have to do anything with me directly. Um, that was happening at home. And at the same time, uh, the, uh, the, the weight, the social weight of the historical amnesia that uh, was hovering over uh, Spain was being, you know, uh, uh, getting heavier and heavier uh, as time went by. So I, I thought that, that uh, I just needed to, to, uh, uh, to do something about it uh, and, and, uh, and incorporate this problematic within, you know, the, the, the context of my work. Um, so uh, uh, put in motion uh, uh, a team uh, in order to, for the first time, uh, uh, work directly with the physical remains of, uh, uh, of the war, the, the political, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the physical sedimentation of the war. I'm talking about bodies. I'm talking about you know anything that physically had been left behind and untouched, because uh, uh, as opposed to let's say the uh, uh, battlefields and cemeteries of the First and Second World War in Flanders or in Normandy or you know, all over Europe, which are you know, well kept, uh, are being investigated you know, constantly, even today. Uh, there, there are still teams you know, uh, working on, on World War I uh, uh, battlefields and, uh, and they have museums and interpretation centers and everything is, is uh, put together to receive visitors and to explain uh, what happened. In, uh, in Spain, uh, if you go and take a walk in the, the Ebro River Valley, which was the, the place where the most important uh, battle of, of the, uh, uh, the Spanish Civil War and was decisive. That was the biggest and uh, decisive in terms of, you know, like condemning the Republic to defeat. Uh, it, it lasted uh, uh, six months. It was like a World War I caliber, uh, you know, battle in terms of length of time in the same place. And there's nothing. Uh, you know, and you kick a, uh, a rock or you move something uh, as you, you know, you walk in the woods and you find things. Uh, you find weapons, you find uh, 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 canteens, you find unexploded, you know, hand grenades, you, know, you name it, uh, and you find bones. Yeah. In, um, nine, in 2003, uh, I, I was... Uh, uh, I received a call by a friend of mine who lives uh, in, in that area, and he said, you, know, you, should, you should come because I have something to show you. And so I did, and uh, he took me uh, in, in a field, uh, it was all cultivated, and uh, 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 a peasant had uh, enlarged uh, his field, you know, so, you know, to be able to have a bigger crop, and had cut on the side of a hill. There was a, like a vertical cord. And out of, of that wall of dirt, uh, human bones were sticking out as, as uh, uh, you know, pipes. You know? Uh, and they were Republican because uh, uh, the, uh, 
the Franco's troops when they fell, they were you know picked up and and uh, the bodies were picked up and they were uh, handled and taken care of. Uh, the uh, the Republican soldiers uh, they they remained where they 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 fell. And years later, my mother told me about that. Uh, you could still see the bodies you know uh, spread all over the place. Uh, three or four. Uh, even five years after the end of the war. So uh, I thought that, that uh, um, uh, I wanted to do something about it. And, and uh, uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first idea was to, uh, uh, because I, we, we thought, I, I'm speaking in plural because, uh, you know, taking into consideration the team that was already, you know, formed and, and uh, around me. Uh, that was probably going to be easier to emphasize the effort in uh, uh, the military part of it. So, you know, we're going to try to find uh, uh, a grave of soldiers. Uh, uh, but, and that would be one way of kind of, you know, like opening up literally, you know, the, uh, the subject and, and, uh, and make it public because uh, we're talking about, you know, about 2000. And, and these things uh, uh, were still not uh, addressed, uh, at least in, the, in my field, in, in the, the realm of culture and uh, visual arts, there was uh, um, basically no one that who, who was uh, dealing with that. We also knew by then that uh, the Association for the Recuperation of Historical Memory existed, uh, and what uh, what their mission was. So we thought, well, if they're you know, doing that and they're dealing with uh, civilian victims of repression, that makes sense that we stay on the, you know, the, the military history side of things. Um, so the thing started. Uh, uh, I, I got a, a Fulbright uh, grant to do the, all the field research, and then there were you know, two foundations, uh, American foundations, who uh, gave me the money uh, to conduct the actual campaign. That was important because I, I didn't want to ask for money in Spain. I, I wanted to be absolutely self-sufficient. And uh, of course, in, in the official level, you know, uh, on the left particularly, on the uh, leftist spectrum of, of politics, uh, uh, there was some sort of, you know, semi-public talk in support of all these things. So uh, we thought that, well, uh, uh, we had help there, potentially. And uh, if not, uh, uh, we were going to uh, um, uh, argue our position, uh, saying that uh, uh, these things should happen in a democratic society, period, regardless of you know, the ideology of uh, the party in government at the time. So uh, um, we were stopped twice. The first time uh, uh, by a central uh, um, a center-right government, I'm, I'm talking about Catalonia. Uh, we were going to do that campaign in, uh, near Barcelona. We were stopped uh, bureaucratically and not so bureaucratically, uh, rather forcefully uh, at, at any, in any case. Uh, and because of that, the loss of time implied that we couldn't do it that year. We had to wait uh, to the following year. That gave us time to do more research. That gave time uh, for an election that took place. Uh, the left won. Uh, there was a, uh, what emerged from that election was a, uh, a coalition, uh, uh, a three-party coalition of uh, leftists. So we said, well, these people had given us support when the center-right guys told us that we couldn't do it. So we said, well, we haven't made, right? Um, we were stopped again. So, and, and I'm, I'm mentioning that because, uh, uh, as I was saying at, at the very beginning, that, that uh, uh, the problematic of, of uh, uh, historical memory in Spain doesn't really depend only uh, on, on the position of the right. It, it's been, it co uh, cuts across ideological lines. And, and of course, I mean, it has to be for a very, very powerful reason, otherwise it wouldn't happen. Uh, so it didn't matter whether you know, the right was governing or, or the left uh, was governing, we were always going to be stopped. So that meant something. And, and uh, 
what obviously means is that uh, uh, there has been an identification made between historical amnesia and political stability. And, uh, and this is something that everybody understands, uh, everybody meaning you know, the, the, uh, the political class, and, uh, and this is you know, the, 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 the rule that uh, you know, has to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, and that's also why it's so difficult you know, to break that, because you, you basically don't have uh, any, any kind of allies based on ideological lines. It's, uh, uh, you, won't, you won't find any help there, you know, and unless the initiative is uh, uh, private, which of course uh, in, in Spain is uh, kind of difficult. You know. So anyway, um, after the second, uh, the second try, uh, I didn't have a place to go. Uh, I had the funding, I had everything, but I didn't have friends. So then is when I, I, uh, I called uh, the Association for the Recuperation of Historical Memory, um, and I told them, I said, uh, you know, uh, this is what happened, uh, and uh, so what do you think that we could do? Uh, uh, and the, the answer was perfect, because you know, said, yes, we have a, a, a campaign that is ready to go, but we don't have the money, so that's it. Because uh, that meant that the, the shift uh, uh, had uh, there was a, 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 a change in emphasis in terms of uh, or, or a major shift actually because we we were going to move from uh, uh, let's say uh, military history so to speak into uh, you know uh, the repression of, of civilians uh, in and uh, during the war and after. Um, that particular place where we went is uh, in Burgos, in, in a very, very tiny uh, village, 300 inhabitants only. And uh, the research had already been done, um, uh, initiated by, a, uh, like very, happens very often, uh, the initiative of one person that was looking for his grandfather and had the, the money to, uh, uh, Rent the excavation equipment to do the first, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, exploration and get the first samplings. Uh, they they did find the place. I think it was a, the third try uh, because the the witnesses that they had, uh, two witnesses were uh, more than 80 years old at the time, and one would say, "Oh, yeah, no, it's uh, you see that that uh, tree there, you know, it's you know." 10 meters, 10, 15 meters towards the right. 85 years ago, that tree there wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't another tree that was there. Uh, so it, it took a while, but uh, uh, finally uh, it was found. And as soon as uh, uh, they reached the archaeological level and the first uh, uh, samples appeared and it had to be stopped, the uh, the police had to be called in so they could uh, take samples uh, determined that they were older than 25 years so if there had been a crime uh, that would have uh, prescribed already uh, and, and we were told uh, you know to go ahead this is the the uh, uh, the place where the the grave was uh, uh, was located very near to uh, a garbage dump And as soon as you know, uh, uh, we started to work. Uh, uh, the first uh, remains uh, appeared. Uh, uh, we found uh, 46 bodies, uh, which at the time was, was, I think, was the largest uh, uh, common grave that had been opened. Um, and out of these 46 uh, bodies, uh, uh, 44 were identified. But two years later. There was a volunteer uh, team, uh, people coming from all over, in, uh, including uh, England, uh, Holland, and and, uh, and some other uh, uh, places, and also you know a plurality of locations in in Spain. There was uh, uh, two, the first two thirds of the. Uh, 
of the grave uh, that were somewhat, I'd say, uh, uh, ordered uh, because uh, people had been shot a, a few meters away and then dragged, you know, from their armpits and you know, uh, put orderly uh, down like sardines. Uh, but then they ran out of time. That, that happened the, the night of, from the 13th to the 14th of October, 1936. And the last part looked like uh, whatever, whoever was left, uh, they were just bunched up in the bottom and, and they were shot from the top. So the, you know, the, the bodies are kind of you know, like mixed. And uh, one thing that, that um, we found was at, at, the, uh, uh, at the same archeological level where the bodies were laying, uh, we, we were finding uh, beer caps, you know, beer, beer bottle caps. That means that they, they were drinking beer while, while they were just you know, shooting the people on sort of a you know, carnival, uh, a sinister thing, you know. Um, some of the volunteers with a fantastic t-shirt. And he had three sisters that um, uh, were talking to uh, Paco Ferrandez and, and, uh, and his colleague, who was a, a, a Dutch sociologist. Uh, and they were talking about, some, you know, about what they remembered. And, and, uh, but uh, that was sort of a, a parallel uh, uh, work that was being conducted by, uh, by Paco and, and his colleague. Uh, which was, uh, they were studying, you know, the uh, uh, morning, and you know, they were doing a, a comparative study uh, in different places, different countries, you know, to determine how people, you know, handle pain and trauma. Uh, and uh, so they, they were interviewing them for that purpose, in addition to, you know, the information that they could, um, they could get. Uh, this is a... Uh, Paco Echevarria, uh, the, uh, the, the responsible uh, of the uh, forensic team. He's very well known uh, in, in the field. And he was showing here, uh, using a, a little stick, the, uh, the trajectory of a, 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 coup, de, a coup de grace, a, a shot, you know, uh, uh, fired, you know, to make sure that the, the victim was dead. Because uh, in this particular case, um, I, I didn't start the project with the idea of, of, uh, of making art. Uh, I started because I thought it had to be done, and, uh, and, and you know, I would reconsider you know, the, the issue uh, afterwards, because I wasn't sure if, if those images were suitable uh, uh, for an artwork. Quite, Clearly, I just, uh, or, or if they were, uh, that particular artwork uh, was going to make any sense in a gallery, you know, uh, in, in New York or, or in, a, in a museum. Um, so I didn't want to, uh, uh, you know, think about, you know, what the, the final result was. You know, the, the idea was to do it uh, because it had to be done and, and uh, the rest uh, was uh, at that point secondary. And what uh, saved that, you know, impasse was uh, uh, the, the central, uh, the International Center of Photography in New York, uh, because the the, uh, the the common ground, so to speak, was you know the, the use of photography that you know solved uh, 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 you know the first step, and they were. Uh, um, uh, preparing uh, uh, two shows that were going to happen at the same time, uh, a, a very, very large show of Robert Kappa and, and the first retrospective of Gerda Taro. Uh, and they, when they, I went to see them, and said, I have this and I don't know what to do with it. And, and uh, so they said, well, you know, uh, we, we can help uh, because uh, if we, we show you with, with, uh, the, along with the other two exhibitions, uh, and that closes the circle because you've been able to shoot what they couldn't. You know. So 
all of a sudden I was a photographer. Uh, up, up to that point, uh, I was an, an artist who took pictures, you know, but uh, uh, because of that exhibition, uh, I was a photographer and, and uh, uh, it was quite incredible because I, w I wasn't expecting it, you know, when they told me, and I thought, oh my God, that's, uh, what are you doing? But uh, um, uh, it was really, it was an incredible gift. And once we, the campaign was over, uh, all the bodies were retrieved and, and sent to the uh, university, Autonomous University of Madrid uh, for analysis. Uh, an issue, uh, um, uh, a gathering was, uh, was conducted with all the people who were involved, the relatives, the witnesses, and, and so on and so forth, and, uh, which was very, very moving. And this is what was left behind, uh, the empty grave, the first time, first time in almost 80 years. Uh, this is a, a kind of you know, makeshift reconstruction of the first two thirds of, uh, of the grave. So uh, the piece was finally uh, uh, put together, it was shown, and, uh, uh, but it hasn't really been shown that many times because it, it always uh, uh, I, I find uh, uh, this, uh, personal difficulty in in having you know that that kind of work shown in a, in an, uh, an art museum. Uh, the piece is, is in the permanent collection of the International Center of Photography, the ICP, in in New York, uh, in America, and not in Spain, which is, which is kind of ironic, but that's how things work. Anyway, uh, that was you know obviously a, a, a quite an uh, an, an experience uh, for me personally. Uh, I'd never been closer. Uh, to that event that was the most important event of my life, although I didn't live through it, uh, than doing this piece. But it, it, didn't, uh, uh, it didn't answer all, all the questions. How am I doing with time? Uh, we've extended it a little bit, so you have like eight minutes. Oh, my God. Well, okay. Uh, uh, so I'll, I want to go... I'll, uh, Further than that, because I, I felt that you know, when there, uh, this you know, continuous uh, uh, repetition, regardless of the fact that everybody uh, uh, pretends and says that the lesson has been learned, is because, uh, uh, and this is a suspicion more than anything else. I'm not a scientist; I'm an artist. But uh, uh, that I think that there must be underlying, you know, behavioral. Uh, uh, Patterns that that make that possible, uh, and that transcends the, the, whether it's a, a war situation or or a, another uh, uh, type of context, you know, con conflictive but not necessarily uh, armed, uh, and it has to do with something that has that, that relates directly to the way we behave. Uh, that's what makes, uh, uh, I presume, uh, so relatively easy the constant transition from a time of organized violence or war to a time of non-organized violence or peace, and vice versa. You know, otherwise, it, it's incomprehensible. How can you do that? Yeah. So uh, I tried to explore this with a piece. It's not finished yet. I'm going to be just showing a few images, uh, which uh, contraposes two locations. One, oh, yes. uh, one is uh, uh, this place in, in, uh, in Galicia, in, in west, uh, northwestern Spain, right on top of Portugal, uh, Casayo, which is a, a, a was, although all that remains now are uh, uh, just you know, the ruins of it, uh, a mine. Uh, in, in, uh, in World War II, what is now done with impoverished uh, 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 uranium uh, in order to harden the, the, uh, the armor of tanks and, and uh, uh, artillery projectiles and, you know, and any, anything that needs to be you know, uh, protected or hardened for penetration. Uh, in World War II, there was no uranium. Uh, it was done with wolframium, wolfram or wolframium. And uh, so it was a, tr a strategic material uh, uh, 
France didn't have Wolframium, England didn't have Wolframium, the Germans didn't have Wolframium, but it's very little Wolframium to speak of in the United States. But Northern Portugal and Galicia is sitting on the biggest bubble of Wolfram in the, in the world. So that, that's, that was the setting. Uh, both Portugal and, and uh, Spain were neutral, uh, but uh, leaning towards the axis. And, uh, and everybody that needed Wolframium was you know, hovering over this you know, to see uh, if they could get uh, what they needed. Uh, I picked only one mine, uh, which is this one. It's called the Cidade dos Alemans, which means the city of the Germans, uh, because it was run by, by the Germans, not only by the Germans, but by the German army directly. And uh, um, they, uh, they took over a, a mine that was already in existence that had been opened by the Belgians, and they just simply started to operate. The, the place is absolutely incredible, because it cannot be seen now uh, in its, its entirety, but... Um, all these slides uh, the, that you see, these are, are accumulations of lattice, because the whole thing is surrounded uh, by a gigantic, you know, as far as your eye can see, of uh, uh, an open air mine uh, for the exploitation of lattice. It's, it's of biblical proportions. Uh, and some, the accumulation uh, sometimes just gives in and just then goes down the valley, so which makes it you know, uh, dangerous. It's abandoned, uh, it's the date, uh, 1944. Uh, the particularity of the place is that uh, it gave work to the, the, the surrounding uh, villages, uh, which were on subsistence level, extremely poor, but that wasn't enough. And then the rest of the labor force were uh, uh, Republican prisoners of war. So it was half mine, half concentration camp uh, for the, the benefit of the Wehrmacht. The officers' quarters, engineers' quarters. Here's what's left of the, the, uh, the barracks of the, uh, the prisoners. So I documented all that. Uh, it's uh, dangerous because everything's unstable, uh, you know, um, and it's totally, uh, totally abandoned and nobody's there. And then, um, I went to another location, which is uh, uh, also abandoned. Oh, this is this. That, that's that's the uh, uh, that's the, the barracks of the uh, the prisoners. And this is one of the entrance. Uh, the, the whole thing is like a like a like a uh, a, piece, a cheese, a Gruyere cheese, full of of uh, uh, mines. And this is the, the other location, uh, which is a, a, a whaling station. Uh, it, uh, it started uh, the late eight, uh, 18th century, uh, and it was functioning until the, the 1980s, when uh, the, the UN implemented the uh, moratorium on, whale, uh, on whaling. Uh, then this thing was abandoned, uh, and it's been just left there uh, since. Uh, what triggered, you know, the picking up uh, this place's counterpart of the, the one that we've seen before is uh, a comment of a friend of mine who's uh, a, a writer uh, who's from Galicia, uh, Francisco Fernandez Naval, who took me there for the first time, and he said, every time that, that I walk into this place, I feel like I'm walking into the, the Treblinka of the cetaceans, uh, of, the, of, the, of the whales, and it's really re oppressive. Um, so I did that. I, doc I documented uh, the place. This is the ramp where you know, the whales were 
you know, dragged all the way to the plant, and then they were, you know, cut to pieces, and uh, for the oil, obviously. These are barbs from the, they find, you know, bones uh, uh, all over. So anyway, the, the, uh, the what is going to be done with this, uh, uh, with this material is that they're both are going to be f fused into one single uh, location. And what I'm trying to uh, 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 point to, uh, just as an hypothesis, is that, that uh, 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 we seem to be condemned un until we find a way to uh, uh, change that, uh, uh, to do damage. You know, regardless of what what we do, you know, uh, uh, we don't need to necessarily you know, pick up an, uh, an arm, uh, a machine gun, and kill someone. Uh, all we have to do is to grow, you know, uh, uh, industrially, economically, anything that that uh, we do, uh, and that because we have to sometimes, uh, one way or another, you know, it implies uh, uh, an irreparable loss of life understood as a total category independently whether it's you know it's people or it's, you know uh, you know whales or anything anything that breathes including the the planet itself which is also you know uh, a living organism so uh, again I cannot really you know prove that that uh, is uh, uh, plausible as a, as a uh, an alternative you know to address it that way uh, but I leave it here. Uh, because I think that, you know, it's worth a try anyway. Thank you.